Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for this time of fellowship, Lord. We ask that you pour in your infinite wisdom, pour in your guidance, Lord. Just let us uh, put a hedge of protection around us, Lord, and uh, be with those that are out there uh, in this cold, Lord, with frozen pipes, uh, low heat. Lord, help them come to us and help us get to them so that we can help them. And Lord, I just ask a special blessing on a lady by the name of Ruby Bailey. Lord, you know what she needs, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Councilor Warner. Roll call, Shelley. Yes, sir. Joe Berg. Honey. Brian Warner. Honey. Bill Anglin. Honey. Heath Austin. Here. Harvey Buzzard. Sean Crittenden. Here. Mike Dobbins. Here. Ricky Hargis. Wanda Hatfield. Uh, honey. Rex Jordan. Here. Dick Lay. Um, Mike Shambaugh. Here. Mary Baker Shaw. Here. Smith. Here. Janice Taylor. Here. Victoria Best Class. David Walking Stick. Where is that walking stick boy? He doesn't live ten minutes from here. <laughs> Snow in. Yes, at this time I entertain approval of the minutes. So moved. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, ayes have it. Okay, down to reports. Uh, Marshall Samuel, good to have you here. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, first, let me apologize for not being at rules last month. Uh, <coughs> it's nobody's fault but mine. My uh, date had the third <laughs> date, and we didn't change it over my computer, so... I came here for rules and it had already happened, so I, I, I apologize, I don't like it, but it is all my fault. I can't, I wish I could throw it on somebody else, but mm -hmm. I cannot. Uh, are there any questions about our, the packet that I presented? And I have some new stuff that I need to bring out real quick, so. Uh, one, uh, last night, you might have heard, we had an armed robbery at a smoke shop in Salina. Uh, we worked with FBI until late last night. And we made an arrest, so we were working on that uh, all night and, and this morning. Uh, we just got done with our Broken Arrow uh, computer giveaway. Uh, some of the council uh, were uh, contacted by my staff to, to uh, go out and be a representative for the giveaways. We do this every year. Uh, uh, Shauna Roach found this at some conference that she was at several years ago. And it's a Broken Arrow Police Department program. Uh, they sponsor, they collect the computers, uh, they collect uh, free computers from all over the Tulsa area. They refurb them, they put uh, uh, Microsoft Office on all of them, and they give them the computer, the monitor, and it's for juniors and seniors uh, in school that, you know, might not have the, the ability or the means to have a computer that are, they're getting ready to go to college. Uh, so my staff will call the school district that we've picked for that year and uh, the teachers and the principal, the, the administrative staff, picks a student, uh, submits it to us and then we bring those computers out. Uh, we, some years we have more computers than others, it just depends on how many, how many computers the Broken Arrow program gets and, and then they give us a percentage. This year we had seven. So we just picked seven school districts, uh, went out and gave that. Uh, we tried to, to hit every least district uh, that we can with the number of computers that we have. So if we hit your district this year, uh, chances are we won't go next year because we really try to, uh, to split it up so everybody gets to participate. But it's a really good program. Any questions for our marshal? I know the local law enforcement really appreciate, you know, your cooperation and working as a unit here. Um, how many marshals do we have total now? I think the one time you said 36 or? No, oh, no, no. We have uh, 33. 33. 33. Uh, one just went to the BIA. Uh, a young man uh, can still get the federal retirement. Uh, he lives in Grove. Uh, and he's going to be working out of the the northern office of the BIA District 2, so he's up there, so we lost him. 
I heard one of our own. I was reading somewhere the, uh, working for the Department of Interior, Charlie Addington. Yes, got Charlie got Addington. I think, did he get that promotion? He did. Uh, he's one of our tribal members. He's a tribal member, and more importantly, he's a huge supporter of my agency. Uh, he's He's been a, uh, I hate to say it, a confidant when I initially took over as the marshal. Uh, I would call him at all hours of the day and night and ask questions. Uh, as, as a new uh, director, you have a lot of questions. Uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, Council Chambal can recognize that when you first become <laughs> an agency head, it's very stressful. And you have questions that sometimes you just can't ask normal people. So Charlie uh, really stood up uh, for us, our agency, and our tribe. So I'm very pleased that he got that position. Yeah. And we'll support him in whatever endeavors he has. Yeah, that's good to hear. <clears throat> Any other questions? Good report. Thank you. Office of the Attorney General, Christy Nemo. <coughs> Recent, or not recent, brief updates. Um, on the Friedman case, we are awaiting a um, decision from the court. We filed our motion for a final order. Um, the Friedman and the Department of Interior filed their responses and what they wanted included in the final order. And we're waiting um, to see see what the judge puts in that order. So um, we will we will share that as soon as we get it. Um, and there's no, no timeline on that. He could si decide today. He could decide in four months. So... Um, UKB, our response and the appeal is due this week, so that will be filed. And um, once I get a file stamp copy, I will send it to your uh, counsel and, and she can distribute it out to you all. Um, I emailed you all this morning on the opioid case because of the um, status of that. I can't say a lot here today. Um, the federal court did issue the preliminary injunction finding that um, Cherokee Nation District Court did not have jurisdiction over the uh, non-Indian defendants and um, not a lot I can say about that if there are any <coughs> questions about the order um, I can talk about that we are working on next steps and I, I've told you guys what I know at the moment and as soon as we know more I will I will let you know so any well, what, what case law were they referencing that that the, about the jurisdiction issue if you can so there's that. a United States Supreme Court case, um, Montana, and it is the discussion over whether, and it's not just court jurisdiction, it's whether tribes can um, regulate, license, um, have, have court jurisdiction over, um, and by other means have um, in, input on the actions of non-Indians in Indian country. And there's a, a two-part test of that, and the first part says that the non-Indians must affirmatively submit to the jurisdiction of the tribe, and they can do that either through um, writing in contracts or otherwise, or through their actions. And um, in this case, the court said that basically them doing business in the Cherokee Nation without any direct um, interaction or contracts with the Cherokee Nation was not enough. And the second prong of that test is if a non-Indian um, business or person is doing something um, that has a catastrophic effect on the tribe. And they went a little bit further in that language that talks about the, the tribe's right to self-governance and that even if uh, these opioid distributors <clears throat> and these pharmacies were doing what we allege that they weren't um, impacting our right to self-govern. <coughs> um, the um, there was some some good that came out of uh, the opinion. We, we weren't pleased with it, and obviously we thought um, some of the language was was um, a little harsh, but the court assumed without finding that um, the 14 counties of Cherokee Nation did constitute Indian country, which is the, the issue in the Murphy case for the Creek Nation. And that's not binding, and it doesn't mean that the court found that we were a reservation, but um, the court just said, assuming assuming that Cherokee Nation is a reservation, we still have to do this analysis. So um, the, um, the defendants in that case had specifically asked the court to find that um, we were not a reservation. So the, the language regarding um, our reservation status or Indian country status um, was, was good overall. Anybody? 
Yes, Counselor. Uh, Chrissy, I have a, a question. Uh, please help me understand. I've, I've, I've thought about this lawsuit several times. These, the op I agree there's an opioid <coughs> epidemic going on, but where are the, are, and we're suing the pharmaceutical companies, but where are the, are, they're not out there just dispensing on the hand fill. Are our physicians ordering it? Or, I mean, are our pharmacies dispensing these? How does so we this? Al we also sued pharmacies in this case. We, we sued the uh, commercial pharmacies, Walgreens. I, I realize that, but they're not just dispensing them without a prescription, Correct. are they? And, and part of the argument is that these pharmacies ignore that there are laws in place that um, whether it's because a doctor is deliberately writing too many prescriptions, because prescriptions are being forged, because clients are doctor shopping, um, that there are safeguards put into place that when pharmacies fill prescriptions, they should know if a doctor is writing too many prescriptions or if that's a forgery or if that person has been to multiple doctors and that they have failed that, that basic duty to enforce those, those rules and policies that would stop them from fill, filling those prescriptions because they're ultimately, you know, the pharmacy is kind of the last stop there because they are, they're not filling them without a prescription, but they are the ones who are physically handing these pills out. And the argument is that there are safeguards in place that, if followed, um, would cut down on the amount of pills that leave the pharmacy. There are safeguards in place. I don't know if you're all aware of that. Where, for example, a doctor is supposed, is required to actually uh, look at their driver's license and look up their record to see if they're getting these uh, narcotics from any other physician or provider. And uh, then the pharmacy is supposed to be doing the same thing. And I don't think you can refill an opioid prescription. Uh, they're non-refillable. I think it's only for one month. And so uh, now I'm understanding. We're suing the pharmacies because they are not. Well, I th OK, I had it in my head that we were suing a national chain or something for doing something wrong. We're not. We're suing individual pharmacies. Is that correct? Well, we, we only named the, the big three chain pharmacies, uh, Walgreens, Walmart, and um, CVS. And, and part of that is when you talk about the doctors, there are for every one pharmacy there are 20 or 40 doctors because there are there are more more individual doctors than there are pharmacies so there i mean we could potentially go after every doctor in the 14 counties that that wrote a prescription but you're you're casting a very wide net there and you're also there there are those who abuse and those who don't and um, and there are places, I mean, there are, there are law enforcement, state and federal law enforcement agencies that have and continue to go after individual doctors who are, you know, running pill mills, as, as they're called. But, um, you know, we, we, we chose where we wanted to file, and, and different places are doing it differently. And the state of Oklahoma, instead of suing distributors, sued the actual manufacturers of the people who make the pills. We sued the people who ship the pills and the people who hand out the pills. So. Um, there are different <clears throat> strategies um, kind of across the country on, on how to deal with this issue. And I'm, I'm sure there are policies and procedures that our physicians uh, through Cherokee Nation are doing it correctly, correct? Yes. yes, and we talked about this when it first came up, and, and we believe um, completely that, that um, in our area that, that our Cherokee health centers are not the problem. Um, our doctors and our pharmacies are, are not how um, these huge number of pills are, are getting on the street and into the wrong hands. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you very much. Thank you. I have a question. Mr. Yes, Mr. Councilor Walker. When's the next status conference meeting on this Freeman issue? It is this month. I don't know the date off the top of my head. It is January 20 something. Lynn, do you know when the next status conference meeting is? I sent it out. I just can't remember. I think it's the 21st. But I don't. It's next week. I think it's. I'll follow up today in an email. It's week from. Oh, it's not the 21st. Okay. It is the 24th, I think. Or the 24. I'll, I'll check for sure and, and email council. And um, unless something changes, we likely will um, just participate in that by phone because since the um, motions have been filed and we're just awaiting an order, um, that'll be the announcement to the court that. Judge, we're waiting on an order from you, and um, we have local counsel in D.C., so it doesn't make sense for us to travel out there for a for a five-minute announcement when everything is is briefed and and before the judge, and we wouldn't have any type of argument to present or anything else. The uh, uh, the brief that that we all received on the uh, from from the Freeman stance, they're calling themselves the United Band 
of uh, freedmen of the Cherokee Nation. Why did, did they name themselves a band? I don't. I, I don't think that has any legal significance. They've never been found to be a you know a separate band. What the opinion says that they're that the freedmen are citizens um, equal to uh, Native Cherokee citizens. So I, the, the, that language is in there, but I don't think it. I don't think it has any legal significance. Where did the language come from? I, I don't know. Was it from the Freedmen group? I guess they. They're, they're that was their themselves. their um, brief. I I will say in their proposed order, um, there's not any language identifying them in any way as a as a band or a group. That was just in their pleadings, and I think it was more of just a identification. Um, I don't I don't believe that it has any type of legal significance, and they're not asking. There was no request for them to be identified as or called or named um, a band or group or anything else so well uh, I was also reading that brief as far as they're requesting the Cherokee Nation to check in quarterly to be sure that the freedman gets uh, so many rights as far as uh, contract held housing and so forth uh, you know I'm not I'm not sure what percent of of our 380,000 citizens receive services through the tribe. But I say if we're going to be fair across the board, I say we get 15% of our 380,000 citizens get services through the tribe, then 15% of the freedmen should get services through the tribe. I mean, that seems fair. But to, you know, report quarterly and put we're all citizens. As of right now, the freedmen are citizens. We all should be treated fairly. And we've objected to that request. We said that that was never asked for okay. um, in the initial pleading, that it got, goes beyond the opinion that Judge Hogan issued. So we have objected to that, and that is part of what um, what we are waiting on. We ask for a, a simple <clears throat> two-page order that says they have the rights of, of Native Cherokees, the court retains jurisdiction. They ask for this expanded order with the reporting requirement and um, the ability for the court to change the order if needed. And we objected to both of those things. And we we laid out argument as to why we should not have to do special reporting because it is our position that the freedmen, per Judge um, Hogan's opinion, were admitted as equal citizens. And we don't do that type of reporting. Um, actually, we do some of that, and that was what we said. You know, there are, there are internal ways, whether it be Freedom of Information Act or monthly rules reports or whatever they are to find out the number of citizens receiving services or the number of people registered to vote or the number of citizens enrolled. And so we already have an internal governmental process for people to request that information. And our argument was we shouldn't have this additional burden of reporting that information back to the federal government because it it is treating uh, freedmen citizens different than other Cherokee citizens if we have this special reporting requirement. So we have objected um, for those reasons to that. So again, that is that is what we're waiting to see whether or not the court includes any type of reporting requirement. But we don't believe that they ask ask for it in the pleadings up until the final order. So um, our, our position is that goes beyond the relief that was originally requested. The other, you know, talk about treating all the citizens fairly. You know, our registration department, we, we put a certain group of citizens above another as far as prioritizing getting cards. You know, we got some, we got, which we've decreased the waiting time in, in our registration department, which is a good thing. But, you know, we, for whatever reason, we put some citizens over another to expedite getting cards. Is that treating citizens fairly? I'm, I'm not entirely sure that's correct. I've, I've had lots of conversations with registration about this. We do have some folks who are dedicated to um, freedmen applications, but we also have folks who are dedicated to adoption and child welfare applications. We have folks who are dedicated to uh, medical emergencies. So, um, you know, I, I don't think that, that other people are being forced to wait or that we're getting behind it, you know I think that we're that we're still caught up for the most part that would obviously be a, a question for registration but we we content we we are very close contact with them because they specifically <coughs> are mentioned um, in the um, court documents 
regarding the freedmen because before freedmen can get any benefits, before they can register to vote, before they can apply for services, they have to be citizens. And the um, order from our court specifically ordered that the registrar begin enrolling um, Cherokee freedmen as Cherokee citizens. So they are under a little more pressure or scrutiny than other Cherokee Nation departments because they're under a court order um, to comply with Judge Hogan's ruling. So um, I, I believe that they're, they're working as hard as they can to process all citizenship applications. And I know the numbers, um, we, we get weekly reports um, that the number of Cherokee by blood being enrolled <coughs> continues to be um, close to the, the normal number. So I, I don't think that it is correct that we are pushing Cherokee by blood applications aside to work on freedmen, although there are employees who are working only on um, freedmen citizenship applications. Okay, well, I just, I have sources inside the registration department and they've been told to prioritize freedmen applications over Cherokee applications. So what you're hearing, what I'm hearing are two different things. So my question is, is where do we go from here as a council? Let, let, let's play this out hypothetically. Judge Hogan's opinion, we don't appeal it. Judge Hogan's opinion becomes law. Our Constitution reads right now, contradicts what Judge Hogan's decision is. Constitutionally, the only way to change our Constitution is a vote of the Cherokee people. Does a special election <coughs> take place to reflect our Constitution to what Judge Hogan's opinion is? What does that look like? Let's play this thing out. What does that look like for this council or What's the next move? Let's just say that it doesn't get appealed, comes law. What what happens to our constitution? What's what's the process that needs to happen to our constitution? I don't believe anything is required. If we have a, a court order that we're bound by, a federal court order, and and quite likely a, a Cherokee Nation Supreme Court order that says this provision of the constitution is void then it is void it is still you know the the letters and the words are still there but the court says this is not operational i i don't think there's any additional process i don't think you have to you, you don't ratify supreme court orders um so i i don't think that there are any steps if the final order from judge hogan is cherokee freedmen are cherokee citizens period. Um, you know, we hope that's what it is, that it doesn't have all this additional um, re reporting requirements or um, jurisdictional issues. And um, our Supreme Court, based on that order, says um, Cherokee freedmen are entitled to citizenship the same as uh, by blood Cherokees. Any constitutional provision that says otherwise is void, then I, I think we go forward under that. I don't, I don't see a situation in which there's some type of vote to approve what the Supreme Court says because that's that's not how it works. So we just leave our Constitution uh, contradicting Judge Hogan's law or opinion and just leave it as is forever? That's, well, until our next constitutional convention, I, I think that there would obviously be changes made then, but um, until then, I don't think, I think a court order um, both federal court order and a, a Cherokee Nation Supreme Court order that said this provision of the Constitution is void is enough to say it's non-operational. Um, if a court finds that a, that a and, and I know that statutory law is different, but if a court finds that um, a statute is void, you don't necessarily at that time automatically have to go in and remove that language. By court order, it says this is non-operational and I, I think the words stay there with the understanding that a court has said that's void and it can't be used to enforce any type of, of constitutional relief. So you don't think the Cherokee people, the tribe, the stakeholders should have any say if, if they want to uh, uphold Judge, Judge Hogan's decision or not. The consequences are, which we experienced in the past, is HUD freezes our funding. So the, uh, the people, the stakeholders of this tribe that elected 17 of us and 
and our, all our elected officials, they, they're not going to have a say in the matter to say who we want to be citizens of our tribe. We're just going to ignore that. Well, I, I, respectfully, I think they had a say when this body, and I understand it wasn't the individuals here, but the reason we have this order from Judge Hogan is the elected officials of Cherokee Nation said, we're going to court and we're going to allow, finally, a federal judge to decide this issue. We're going to be bound by it and we're going to move forward. And that's what we have here. So because someone doesn't like the outcome doesn't mean that they didn't have a stake in, in the decision-making process through their elected officials. I don't think it's a matter if they like it or don't like it. I think it's a matter of constitutionally the way it reads is that Cherokee people are the ones that amend or ratify our Constitution, not the elected officials, not the Supreme Court, uh, not the AG, but the Cherokee people. Now, in my opinion, the processes of this is, is our people should have a right and make them aware of the consequences if they vote to kick you know, the four groups of people out or to bring them in and let them be the ones to decide if, if they want to cut federal funding and, and so forth because those are the ones, th those, that's the voice of Cherokee Nation. Those are the stakeholders. That's the tribe. But to ignore them and leave them out and now we got a select few that's making decisions whether how our Constitution needs to read, that's unconstitutional. I know that can be challenged in the Supreme Court, but... And I, and I think it can, and uh, again, what, I'm, what, I'm not being disrespectful, yeah. but I, I think that that is what, the, the... It's the being purpose? challenged. What's the purpose of having a Constitution? If we're not going to abide by it, we're not going <coughs> to well, We're also bound by our treaty, which, you know, this isn't... Judge Hogan didn't say that a, a law that we passed prohibits this. He said the treaty by which we made a constitution prohibits us from doing this. And, you know, the answer is, the final answer, once it becomes final, is we cannot, by constitution, prohibit freedmen from citizenship because of the treaty. So there is nothing that if this is a final order, there is nothing that we can do to change that. And if there, if someone attempted to vote on this issue again, we would end up right back in federal court, and the federal court would say, Cherokee Nation, we told you that you couldn't do this. The treaty prohibits you from denying Cherokee freedmen citizenship in the Cherokee Nation. And it doesn't matter how many times you attempt to amend your constitution, you're also bound by this treaty, because that is what you made a government-to-government -go -government relationship with the United States under, and you're bound by it. And that's what the Hogan decision says, that you cannot change your constitution. So even if it was voted on again, federal court is going to tell us, we've already told you once that you can't do that because this treaty binds you to allow Cherokee freedmen to be Cherokee citizens at the same level as all other Cherokee citizens. Well, and, and I think that, as I said, there, there is a way to, to challenge this, and it's in our Supreme Court, and we're wow. there. We're waiting on a decision. Well, you've... Uh I was just I was filling the AG's office out and see where they're at. So uh, it's unfortunate that our people's not going to have a voice in the matter. It's not fair uh, to say that though, because they have um, had. They they had a voice in the past, and it's it's big no ignored. And this our administration have not fought for our people's voice to the highest degree possible. Counselor, that is unfair. This body unanimously voted to go to federal court and have a federal judge determine what the treaty said and what that meant for our Constitution and what that meant for our citizenship. So to say that the people didn't have a voice is unfair because the people who were elected by Cherokee citizens made that decision. And again, because someone now doesn't like the outcome doesn't mean it wasn't fair or doesn't mean that people didn't have a say in it. Well, the people's voice supersedes this, this council. The, the Constitution is amended by the Cherokee people, not, not the elected officials, not the AG's office, not just yes, Hogan, Cherokee people. And we have a duty to fight for that voice at, at, at the very top, 
is until we can't go any further. I feel like we we cut our people short by bailing out early or settling when we we should have fought this to the highest degree possible. And if it didn't work out, look our people in the eye and say, you know what? We did everything in our power and ability to fight for you. This didn't happen this way, and we, you know, we lost. So um, now we gotta we gotta ratify our constitution to reflect Judge Hogan's decision. Here, here's the consequences. You know, we could possibly be disfranchised. We could lose federal funding. Let those people be the ones that. Let our Cherokee people be the ones to voice their opinion, whether we get our funding cut, or because they're the ones that get affect, that that gets affected by it. But for us to dictate and have our own agendas, that's that's not democracy. This isn't our agenda. This is a federal court order. Okay. We also, as, as bound as we are by Constitution, we're also bound by treaties. And I think that there is just a difference of opinion on this. Well, there are going to be people who have, have different opinions. Before the ink dried on those treaties. I mean, the Treaty of 86 was broken a year later on that tobacco tax compact. But to this day, we rely on those. We rely on those for funding. We rely on those for jurisdiction. We rely on those for basis of our Constitution. But why is it that we rely on the Treaty of 1866 so heavily? Because it's the last one we signed. Well, you think it has anything to do with there's always been pressure to terminate tribes throughout the history of Indian country from Congress? and Of course. And, and without a treaty, yeah. That, that is our tie to the federal government. That, that is our government-to-government -government relationship with them. We enter in an agreement, and we say, federal government, you're still bound by these provisions, and therefore we are too. And I agree that there have been provisions of it that have been broken, but we've sued about it. We, we're in suit about it right now. Um, you know, we can't just say because you have violated one provision of this, we're not following it either because that's a slippery slope because then they come back and say, okay, well, we're not, you know, we, we promised in treaties to provide for the health and welfare of Cherokee people, but we don't want to do that anymore, so we're not going to give you any health funding. Yeah. We're not going to give you any education <coughs> funding. Um, you know, it's sovereignty is great and the Cherokee <coughs> Nation is great to exist, but if we lose our entire relationship with the United States government because we refuse to honor treaties, um, th that impacts our ability to serve our citizens. Well, I, our citizens will be the one to make that decision, not, not us. The other thing is, is you guys not have an agenda. Having a 30-minute turnaround when Todd Hembree had an 80-page brief from Judge Hogan, a preliminary opinion, <coughs> bring it to our Supreme Court, uh, Supreme Justice Garrett, and he reads Respectfully, 80. sir, I think if you think Henry has an agenda, let you let should talk finish. to him. He's let not finish. here to defend well, himself. Can I finish? No, because it's okay. not fair. Yes, it is. <clears throat> there's, there's a 30 minute turnaround when Todd submitted an 80 page opinion and he, he made a, a preliminary order to the Cherokee Nation to allow Freedmen to come uh, get registration, uh, get applications processed immediately. Now, to say that you know, they, I don't know, it, the whole thing to me, that there, there was agenda, there, there was some specific things that took place, uh, but that's neither here nor there. Um, I just hope that our, in the end, I hope our people have a voice in the matter. So that's all I have to say. Speaker. Anybody else? Thank you. Yes, Councilor Lake. I just have one question. Okay. Chris, Chris Sir, I apologize if I was out of line, too. No, that's you, you did good in explaining that. I, Thank you. Yeah, Tell Councilor Walking Stick that I apologize if I no, was you, out no, of line. No, you did good. <laughs> Go ahead, yes, Councilor. And, and I've got a question that doesn't come up under under your report. It comes up later. Are you going to stay around? I'll be here until we're done. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> you know, Chris, um, you know, we're talking about a handful of people making decisions for us here. You know, the, the legislative group that made that decision, I think, was back in 07 or 08. This, this body, correct? That, that, yes. that wanted to move forward. 
<clears throat> and it is unfortunate here. Uh, and the 1866 treaty gives us a lot of leverage on, on abiding by that treaty. And uh, firsthand, when I went to see Dollar General versus uh, uh, Mississippi Choctaw versus Dollar General, I sat there and watched those nine Supreme Court judges. And, and, and right there I thought, you mean these nine people right here, this handful of people, not necessarily passion towards our Native Americans, get to make these decisions that determine the livelihood of who we are. Fair or not, as being a limited sovereignty, going back to Wooster v. Georgia, the ruling that John Marshall made, that's the life that we're living right now. But having said that, we as a Cherokee nation, we still have so much going for us out of the 560 you know, tribes that we have out there. You know, I mean, here in the state of Oklahoma, where else would you want to be employed? Nowhere, I can Nowhere. tell you. <laughs> We're I mean, the yes. best. But, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not the ideal world that we live in. And, and the Supreme Court usually only hears like two Indian cases a year. And most time you don't want to go up there and go against that Supreme Court if it's an Indian issue. You stay away from that court because they're not all as happy with Indians as you might think. Uh, and if you ever get a chance, go up there and listen to that Supreme Court under this administration, for sure. And, and you'll walk away there scratching your head and going, I need to go back to Tahlequah or Barnesville or wherever you live because they're not very friendly. So thank you for the update. Good questions by Councilor Walkenstick. Good I think answer. it was educational for all of us here. Good answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Gwen Terrapin. Always count on Gwen. Good morning. I hope everybody's staying warm. Where are you getting all that Pendleton, Gwen? <laughs> Just kidding. Go ahead. Different places. <laughs> I'll hook you up later. Okay. <laughs> uh, for 2017, we had a total of 24 uh, FOIA and GRA requests. 18 of those were FOIA. Six were GRAs. None of them are outstanding. Everything's been answered so far. And for 2018, um, I've gotten one so far, and that one is still outstanding. But other than that, the website's been updated. There's some things that I'm going to be taking off and, and backing up. So if you go on there and look at anything prior to 2015 um, to 2012, if there's anything that you guys see that you want, just holler at me. I'll always have the records, but I'm going to go ahead and take that stuff off the website. So. But other than that, I don't have anything else. Any questions for Gwen? Yeah, Councilor Lay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gwen, so you're going to take them off the website because it's cluttering up things? Probably. Yeah. But you're not going to uh, throw them away? Oh, or no. Disperse them or no. uh, shred them or anything like no, that? No, sir. You're going to keep them for it? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Good point. Anybody else? Good report. Thank you. We have uh, election commission, Connie Parnell. Not Connie, but. Good morning. Would you please introduce yourself for the record? Spears. I'm the administrator for the election commission. Um, Did you get I think that? I've got to, yeah, I, I let them know that I was gonna report today. Uh, I got to meet most of you and shake most of your hands and those of you that I haven't, I'll look forward to getting to meet the rest of you. Uh, before I jump into my report, I wanted to recognize the commissioners and the current staff of the Election Commission um, uh, for, for welcoming Charlene Keyes and myself, the new employee, uh, uh, into the family, so to speak. So each one of them has been nothing but um, knowledgeable and generous with their time and most importantly with the uh, new staff patient. Um, so after the election, um, the staff was able to resume their attendance at the community and service meetings this past quarter reporting from uh, october to december you can see that we were able to attend 15 of those events and received 173 voter registrations from those um, lastly the election commission has already begun preparing for the 2019 election cycle with the new staff in place we found it necessary to not only begin preparing our new documentation uh, for 2019, but also trained about each component of the election process. Uh, there's not a lot that um, 
new staff coming in uh, know about conducting elections. So what we're doing is we're taking the opportunity to not only update our documentation, but train on each on each piece. We started this by looking at the election timeline calendar and we'll proceed month by month examining what takes place in that month in preparation for the election. So what we did this month is we looked at what's going to happen December of this year 2018 and what's going to happen in January of 2019. So the candidate packets will be available uh, December 2018 and the absentee ballot request opens January 19. So we'll proceed just like this month by month, uh, piece by piece and preparing for each step uh, in the election process. Um, everything else uh, data wise I have included in my report. Um, did any of you guys have any questions on that? <clears throat> any questions on the written report? Yes, Councilor Buzzer. I don't, <clears throat> it's not so much a question, Marcus, but I talked to some of the election officials about requesting, and I want to officially make this request, of a new precinct being located in District 10. Okay. That'd be in the northern part of District 10, up around uh, southern Miami, uh, Fairland area. Now, we have an office in Hampton, but we're missing a lot of people that live in, uh, in, Ottawa, in northern Ottawa County, which would be southern part of the Miami, city of Miami. So, I'd like to take a look at that and do a feasibility study and see if we need one years ago we used to have one up there then it was done away with probably i don't know eight or nine years ago but okay. i've had those uh, requests from people that it's just a little too far for them to travel from miami over to Athens to do it so take a look at that i know we already have six districts six voting precincts in district <coughs> 10, which is a large district it's, it's spread out it runs really a long way so i'm going to formally make that request that we take a look at that and okay. see if it's feasible to do another precinct up there okay, okay. i got that noted i'll check on that thanks sir <clears throat> yes, Councilor Lake. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, election records retention. I understand there's a plan, or you've already made a plan to start shredding or, or tossing the old election results. Or, could, could you go over that? What you really um, We have uh, in, in the Act. We have a procedure and a policy uh, set in place, and without that in front of me, I don't. I can't speak to what that is um, but I can I can get that what exactly those uh, retention um, timelines are if you if you want I can get that for you how what do you keep now uh, and how far back do you keep it? there are there are there are different timelines for different things um, we'll keep like say sign-in sheets and um, and things like that for different times. There's there's things that we keep for just um, like three years, and then there there are personal things that we'll that we may keep for uh, I believe seven years. But like like I say, I'll have to get um, get back in the office and and get the get the actual numbers on that and get back with you. Uh, well, what what I'm afraid of is before you get back, you guys are going to throw away a bunch of stuff. No. Apparently, there are some lawsuits that are on the books now that that want to access some of these records that are not new or not you know they're several times back and so what 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 are you know I, i'm just trying to figure out what the retention time is. and can you guys microfilm that so you can keep it all anyway and just keep it in a smaller package um i mean that's something that we can that we could look into um, and like I say, that the policy on the retention uh, is is something that is that is in our act um, that I would have to um, look into. Uh, we are formulating a response um, to to those questions about the retention. Well, and I'm not planning a lawsuit, but I I see those come through every now and then, and it's not about this election. It could be about who voted in election a time or two ago. And, and you, of course, you all see it. But, so I'm concerned about the retention. And if nothing else, I understand keeping all this paperwork is a big load somewhere. Yeah. And if nothing else, you can't microfilm it or, or so that you can bring it out in case there's a question in, as time goes along. Yeah. yeah once again, um, with me only being there 
being here in the office for a couple months, those are some of the things that, that I'm still learning. Uh, I'm still learning about uh, well, the And the, I understand the functionality. that, that you've yeah. got kind of some powerful people behind you sitting on the back <laughs> row that are listening to me. <laughs> so I know they, un you know, you understand and they understand what's going on here. And so I, it, my advice is you better start microfilming that stuff. That's just a, an, an advisable from some guy from Oshalade, Oklahoma, because every time something happens in an election that somebody don't like, I guarantee you there's going to be a courthouse action. And if you guys can't produce the documents, we're all, you know, every, not we, somebody's going to say you're hiding something. Right. And it happens, and it's happening now. And so, I, I'm not telling you, I can't tell you. My advice is to save everything you got, and if nothing else, take it to microfilm. Mm -hmm. And I know there's probably a little cost to that, but I think it's worthwhile in the long run so that nobody comes down the road later complaining. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> Council, quit. Sir, if there was a guy who never really understood the absentee ballots or how they work or how you go about getting one, does your office, uh, could, could this guy go sit down <coughs> with somebody in your office and get schooled on that there? Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. We would love to have anybody in there and discuss any part of the process. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Welcome. Yes, anybody else? Good report. We have Tax Commission Sharon Swift. Right. Right. Morning. I believe you do have my report. I'll try to answer any questions you might have. Just an update. We did have to close. If you get phone calls, we did have to close the Adair office yesterday due to we had no heat. Even though we plugged up one um, portable heater, if you put more than one, we flipped all the breakers. And one wasn't enough to keep it warm in there, but we did get heat installed yesterday afternoon, so they're back open today. But just in case you get a call, that's the reason it was closed. Cause it was really, really cold in there. <laughs> so other than that, I'll try to answer any questions you might have. Councilor Critton. Quick comment, Ms. Webston, thank you for always <coughs> answering and doing your best to help my folks. You're I appreciate you a lot. Anytime. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Lay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sharon, I need a tag off of no water or do it. I'll, I'll take either one. <laughs> okay. Like I said, that's up to you all. <laughs> you always tell me the chief's in charge of that, and I'm looking at him right now. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Anybody else? Comment. Councilor Vesco. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, Adair is in my district, and I just wanted to say that probably not anyone was even out yesterday. It was so dang cold. So <laughs> <laughs> It was cold. And the unit that we have is actually in the wall, and so they had to take that out and cut the hole bigger. So, I mean, it got really cold in there. And so I actually had the ladies that were there come and work in the Tahlequah office yesterday. So... I apologize for any inconvenience to our citizens for that, but I don't think they would have wanted to sit in there anyway yesterday. <laughs> it was really cold. Anybody else? Thank you, Ms. Webson, for your report. Thank you. Uh, up next is uh, Ms. Karen Ketcher, Self-Governance. Good morning. Good morning. It's better cold out there. I think everyone has my report, and if they've got any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Councilor Lay. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Appreciate it. And and Karen, and this is where the AG or assistant AG may come in handy for me a little bit. I don't know whose question this is, but on page 17 of your report, there's, there's an E, the revised certificate of degree of Indian blood policy. And on December 18th, 2017, BIA issued a revised policy. Could you go? Have we seen that? I've not seen it, it yet. Yes, we have. I haven't seen it. Um, it was 
it came to us, I think, shortly after that. I think it got it faxed to me that very day. Has, Basically, has it been sent to the council? No, I don't. Not that I know of, unless Linda may have given it to uh, Miss O'Leary, the registrar. Can you highlight the differences? It's basically the same policy. The only thing it does, it, it clarifies some things in there with regard to uh, reissuing CDIBs that have been voided in the past. Uh, probably uh, who makes the final decision on appeals and denials and things like that. It, but it's basically the same documents are required to get a CDIB as it was before. It just, it just clarifies and brings it up to date because the last one that was done was done back in, I think, uh, I did it when I worked for the Bureau, so it's been many years ago, probably 20 years ago. So it's, it was an old policy. Things have changed in the tribe. So basically all it did was clarify some things that, had, that needed to be brought up to date. So the one thing, I think it added one, one document that you could use as supporting documentation to show lineage, and then it clarified that the, um, I believe the regional director, correct me if I'm wrong, was the only person that could sign a denial. That's that, right. that couldn't be delegated down. Um, and it doesn't, I mean, it affects us in, in the sense that we process those via a contract from the BIA, but we follow those their rules when they do CDIB. And if anyone... Um, is, was curious because I know this issue has come up. It, it did not have anything to do with um, non by blood Cherokee citizens. Um, what, what was, can you all send us the before and after? Sure. Yes. Sure. Send it to Gail and she can give it to all of us so we can look at it. Has that been dispersed out to the public? No, it's not. It's just a policy that was written many years ago. Uh, there was a decision that was made that. Uh, there was a decision that got taken to IBIA, which was called the Morgan Underwood case. And in that case, it, they overturned a decision by the Bureau about where they had revoked a CDIB because it was erroneous. And uh, that court overruled us because they said we had unpublished or unwritten rules. So uh, they tried to get regular CD regulations in place for certificates of degree of Indian blood, but that has not happened yet, and that's been probably 30 years ago. Yeah. And, and so I this policy... governmental policy. Yeah. What, one thing I'd like to ask, if there's another change in the future, could you all immediately notify the council? Yes. Well, yes. this is the first I've heard of it. Yeah. This, when uh, I saw it in the book. Yeah. And this only pertains to CDIBs. It doesn't, you know, this has nothing to do with citizenship or membership in the tribe. It's only certificates of degree of Indian It's one of the most important documents of the Cherokee Nation. Yes, it's it is. Most important policy. Yes, it is. And so I'd like to see it when it comes in. Okay. Thank you. And on the, on F, the contract support cost settlement. Yes. Does anybody Christy. know about that? <laughs> Or, We're waiting much, on a check. How yeah. much was that check and where is it going? Well, um, we don't know exactly how much it is because they will, as of the day they cut it, will figure interest. Um, the settlement amount was very, oh, do you have it? I was going to say it's very close to $6 million, but it's also a 1990 nine claim i believe or yes. no, it's what they call the 98 claim but 98 it, but so it starts from we have interest on it for all of those years and with the interest it will be around 10 million dollars but we don't know the exact amount until it's cut because interest will be figured as of a date certain all the documents are signed everything's sent to treasury we are simply awaiting a check on that and it will um it will go to the general fund there were questions about whether or not Half of it will go to the newly created Sovereign Wealth Fund because that law says that um, half of all settlements will go there. But um, this money falls under the, the reason it all goes to the general fund is because it was improperly expended. And I say improperly not in the sense of we did anything wrong, but we should have, in 1998, we should have gotten this money from the federal government to support IHS contracts. Because we didn't, we had to spend general tribal dollars to support those IHS contracts. So this money goes in to basically replenish um, tribal dollars that were spent to support federal contracts. And so it will be appropriated however council appropriates it. So, so in other words, council could take that funding and appropriate 
for concurrent scholarships if it's so desired? Through, through the normal appropriations process, yes. I mean, I, I don't know all the details of how you, how you move money around in conjunction with the treasurer and admin, but yes, well, it will go into the general it's, fund. It's and a risk on that, so I can spent. tell you that. <laughs> Sometimes you got to take the bull by the horn, but it's a wrestling match. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councilor Buzzard. Yeah, uh, Karen, on the road issues for Sequoia High School, has that been resolved to the Bureau? No, I don't think it has. I know that Mike, well, not Mike, Mike yeah, Mike, Mike Lynn. Lynn has been working on that. Okay. But I don't think it's been resolved as yet. I know, I know they, that was the same problem that the Haskell Indian Nation University up there too. We could not get them to, to do anything of those roads and I take Sequoia probably in the same situation. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'd still like to see it get done. I'd like to keep those roads looking nice on our campus. I keep talking to you. Okay, okay. thank you. Thanks, sir. Anybody else? <laughs> Councilor Taylor. Um, the LIHEAP audit, is that a routine um, thing every few years we come up for review? Nothing, I mean, no, no not, red flags that cause not, them to Not that us. I know of, okay. and I think Marsha and them are, are on top of it, so okay. we should be good. Okay, thank you. That's all I had, Chair. Anyone else? Thank you, Ms. Ketcher. Okay. Appreciate you. Uh, Gaming Commission, Mr. Jamie Humminberg. <laughs> Morning, everyone. Morning. I'm glad you can see me on this fine spring day. <laughs> I believe uh, the report made it into your packets again. Um, hopefully, uh, 2018 will see the continue of that streak. So, um, three things I wanted to share with the council that were not included in that report. First is the NIGC issued its final regulations on class two technological aids and uh, technical standards for class two gaming machines. They issued that final guidance or that final rule on December 27th. And if you might recall in the past uh, updates, I've mentioned that the changes that the NIGC were contemplating had to deal with machines that were in effect or standards that were in effect uh, in 2008 that would govern all uh, machines in existence at that time. Uh, they had an artificial barrier in the sense of a, a deadline that was set by which all machines would have to come up with, to the new standards. Tribes and uh, the industry voiced their concerns about those regulations, and as a result of that, the NIGC took those back under advisement, looked at what the tribes had to say with respect to the performance of those games, the security of those games, took those to heart, and actually removed that deadline. So the... Um, uh, the NIGC did remove the uh, compliance deadline, the sunset provision that was included within those 2008 regulations. Uh, it did place a little bit more onus on the tribes in terms of reporting and tracking of those types of machines, uh, but it is a good thing for Class II Indian gaming uh, that we are no longer uh, looking at the sunset provision being applicable to otherwise viable games. Okay. Um, our 2017 external audit is underway. Uh, it is on track to meet the deadline. We have to have that audit submitted to the NIGC by the 28th of January. Uh, we are then also required to submit our external audit to our state compliance agency within 30 days after that. Uh, we will be able to make both of those um, deadlines. Uh, I don't believe we'll have a hitch in that. And finally, uh, after the report went out to the council, we did get the December numbers in for uh, the uh, uh, compact fee payment statements. And this year, uh, 2017 is the highest amount that we paid in under our compact. We paid just a little over $19 million, uh, surpassing last year, I think, by about 800,000. Uh, so it was a very good year for Cherokee Gaming Facilities in 2017. So with that, if there are any questions, I'll be Glad to answer them. Councilor Austin. Uh, Jamie, how often does your commission meet? Uh, the commission meets every month. Uh, we um, uh, just published our 2018 calendar. I can get you a copy of that if you'd like. Would, uh, I, I've asked for this before, uh -huh. uh, for you to send it to Gail so that she can put it on our calendar so that we know about it. Okay. Uh, there's not a question that uh, what you guys do over there affects us. 
a lot. Yep. <laughs> and yet, you know, it's a great mystery. I think none of us ever attend your meetings. Uh, we we need to attend some of your meetings. Uh, so I'd sure appreciate if uh, you'd follow through and make sure that Gail gets that information on a monthly basis so that mm -hmm. uh, it gets in our calendar. Will do. I'll get it over to her as soon as I get back to the office. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Shaw. <clears throat> Uh, Jamie, when's our gang, our gaming uh, compact up with the state of Oklahoma? The compact is set to uh, come to term in 2020. Uh, it is what I call a, an evergreen compact. Uh, and Chrissy may want to elaborate on the, the legal aspects of this, but even in the event of uh, the compact date coming and going, the compact itself and the, the games that we play, everything that uh, is permitted, if you will, underneath that agreement continues uh, and automatically renews for another 15-year term. Uh, so the compact original deadline will come up, I believe, in May of 2020. Right now, uh, we have, uh, we're doing, what is it, uh, is it called class four and five? Is that what we're doing? No, we're, we're doing class three under the compact. Uh, Depending on who you are, some call it class two and a half uh, because it incorporates some aspects of class two elements of gaming in there with it. But we uh, all compacts are for class three gaming. Will we ever get class two? Uh, class two uh, has been our bread and butter for a great number of years. And in fact, our class two uh, side of the uh, gaming facilities does very well. Uh, class two consists of electronic bingo. Uh, and uh, non-house card, uh, excuse me, non-house bank card games. So right now we've got then two, three, will we get class, then maybe I'm wrong, four? Well, no, there's only three classes, uh, but the, the number of games and the variety of games under class three is a little bit more broad than what is currently contemplated in our compact. Uh, we do play a version of craps and roulette. Uh, they are card-based to meet the terms of our compact. Uh, Full class three, if you will, would see the provision for actual dice, actual wheels and balls, uh, as well as uh, what is being touted as Vegas style electronic slot machines. Uh, right now, the games that we have are a form of instant bingo, and they employ a mathematical model that is akin to the game of bingo, whereas a uh, mathematical model for a slot machine operates slightly different. It's a little bit more robust. Uh, but uh, right now, the, uh, the types of games that we have are specified within the compact. So to change that, you would have to change the actual state law and the uh, language in the model compact. In 2020, is it possible we can add uh, craps, roulette, uh, whatever? I will probably defer that to the chief and, and to the AGs on that. Uh, that that is a decision above my above my pay grade. Okay. Okay. And then I had one other question, and it had to do on the licensing summary. It has key employees that we have 964 in Petusa. What's a PMO? Oh, um, uh, that's a shorthand that we use for primary management official. Primary management mm -hmm. official. That is that's anyone that can hire and fire that sets policy that can uh, contract, that can otherwise bind the casino uh, by decisions that they make. So we have 388 in Catoosa, mm -hmm. but in key, well, the, what, then a key employee, I mean, what's the difference there? A key employee uh, is more of your, I'll say your frontline employees, whereas PMOs are your supervisors and managers. So a, a key employee can consist of a, a cashier, a, um, an accountant, uh, uh, anybody that uh, is really in non-managerial type or non-supervisory type positions. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to follow up on your question with dice and balls. Um, state law would have to change to allow us to do that in our casino. And Will we do anything to implement that change? Um, there's talk now the, the issue is if if gaming laws change the state wants more money so it's always a, a tightrope to walk between the tribes of the state the state's obviously looking for more money right now with their budget issues so um, they may be open to um, changing the law to expand gaming but in, in exchange for that they'll probably want more money so um, there's 
almost every year there's some type of talk about it at the state legislature, but nothing nothing definitive at, at this point. Thank you. Councilor Lay. You have Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I have attended I don't know how many, but several meetings of the Cherokee Nation Gaming Commission and and they do an excellent job for us including the commissioners. It's it's a very complex and sometimes legalistic meeting and and the width and breadth of what they do is really was an eye opener to me. Those of you who will attend will see the same thing. Uh, they do a tremendous good job for us and they make sure we're buttoned down and we do the right step every step of the way. And I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, Jamie. Good report. You. Uh, next up, Human Resources, Mr. Nason Morton. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I've submitted the written report, and next month, I'd like to do an update on a couple of the projects we've been doing to try to automate our systems. Um, what we try to do is we take the current system, it may take two or three steps. We try to reduce the steps, but at the same time, uh, make sure that it's actually easier on the employee as well as the applicant or the person we're dealing with for the process. And I think we have a couple more, and I'll follow up with those next month. Um, on your report for the end of the year, most of these, I think all of these on this sheet, go by calendar year. So this was the report as of December 19th, 2017. So that kind of gives you the year to date on some of the stats I run monthly. So that way it gives you kind of an opportunity to look at. Um, I show them each month, but it's nice to look at the end of the year and go, okay, that's how many we've had throughout the entire year. Does anyone have any questions? That's crazy. Yeah, uh, Nason, uh, I'm going to do this confidentially and not mention any names or anything, but I wanted you to be aware of We might want to do it after the meeting if it's going. With that caveat up front, it might be easier yeah. for me to well, I, hang around. Just just, just uh, trust me that I can stay under the law. But I uh, had a situation where a person was accused of something pretty serious. And... He went ahead and got to work a month and a half, and this person that I'm not naming, uh, I didn't believe for one second. Of course, that don't hold much water, but known him a long time. Uh, I was really surprised at this, but that's not my job. But he went ahead and worked a month and a half. Had a little meeting, and obviously it was found that he didn't do it. And he was suspended for a whole week without pay and worked a month and a half obviously found he didn't do it suspended for five days without pay and that really hurt a Cherokee family so the process there I would ask you to to look at and, and tighten up that so things like that don't happen again because five days without pay to all of my life is pretty pretty crucial for something that obviously he didn't do. So I thank you for looking into that. And are you res do you have something to do with the behavioral health hiring? On behavioral health, we assist like every department. It's just um, as far as who they hire, mm -hmm. they decide we just run the process yeah. to, and then we would make the conditional offer. And, and uh, we also we advertise for the job and we help with your um, job description. So long story medium, we're involved in the process. And Chairman, if you allow me just a minute, uh, this may be off track a little bit, but I want to make the council aware. Uh, I'm I'm rooting for uh, Dr. Graham, Dr. Stalkett. We visited about this, and they're on it. And uh, but I want to make you aware. Uh, there's a problem with behavioral health um, and like I said Nason this kind of off your trail a little bit but but I wanted to make it known had a had a guy 
admitted he had a problem and was ready to get help. And, and I told him, go to our emergency room and do it. And so we got him there. And of course, everybody knows it's so cliche, the first step in getting help is admitting you got a problem and going. Well, we had to let him go because there wasn't enough beds and, and, his, and his elder uh, watchman there called me and said that they had, uh, uh, he'd had another lapse. I mean, he's, he's fine now, but, but uh, I really want to look at that behavioral health. We can't, we can't be sending them home if they're ready to get help. And like I said, I'm not taking a stab at anything other than just we we got to issue that. If we're going to have uh, bigger lawsuits on things, this grassroots thing, when they're wanting help, by golly, we have to make sure we got some beds for them to, to get them help. So I'm confident that Dr. Stalkup and Dr. Graham's going to look into it. But this is kind of where I wanted to fit this in here if I could. So. Thank you for helping me kind of be watching out for that. You bet. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Lay, did you have a question? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mason, the exit interview process for positions, how's that come along? Um, update since last time, we have set a, we sent an email to the supervisor list, um, letting them know the process, and we've also had a, um, separate contact with health services, just a meeting in addition to that to um, check on the process. And so I'll, I'll see how that's going. But the first part was to make sure to remind everyone, hey, here's what we do. So basically um, send an email out to this, all the supervisors going, this is the process. And now we'll just um, check and see what participation rates there are now. Can you share the memo, or not the memo, but policy with us yes I'll send you something thank you anyone else Councilor Hargis yes, I'd like to speak to you after the okay I'll just hang around and we also um, I forgot to mention this the last meeting a couple meetings back um, requested that we follow up and let people know that as soon as someone indicates that they're leaving um, the process for putting a requisition in to um, hire someone in their place. And we did an email on that one as well. Is that health or in, in any job? Everybody. Any job. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Councilor Shaw, I'm sorry, sorry about that. I just Council have Shaw. one question. If a patient, excuse me. If one of our employees is suspended, and it turns out that they were suspended, <coughs> uh, do we pay them their, their back pay? Like if it goes for an appeal and they win on appeal or determination that suspension? Well, the example that uh, Councilor Crittenton was just referring to, this family went out without pay for five days. And, you know, that can be quite serious to a family. And then it turns out this employee is innocent. Should we not be paying him his salary that he missed? For the five days? Yes, sir. I believe it's reimbursed. I'll double check and make sure. Because if they go through the appeal process and it's overturned, I believe they're put back in the position they would have been. But I will double check on that one for you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Thank you, Nason. Thank you. Uh, looking down, uh, going into old business, we have none pending. Uh, new business. Uh, up first, uh, Councillor Shaw, would you like to take that one? Yes, I would. It's a resolution confirming the nomination of Dr. Charles Grimm as a board member of the Cherokee Nation Health Partners. We'll entertain a second. Second. All right. Second. Uh, discussion. Councillor Lay. I'd like to be included as a sponsor if, if I could, please. Uh, sponsors? Other sponsors? I would. Uh, looks like we got unanimous. Okay. okay. All right. Well, uh, those in favor, say aye. 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 No opposed? <laughs> None opposed. All right. Moving down. Uh, Speaker Bird. 
chance as you. This is a reappointment of uh, Luke Barto as a district judge of Cherokee Nation Court. Luke, are you here? That form of a motion. Second. second. We have a motion and a second. Luke? You have it? Yes, sir. Your chance. Say what you'd like. It's been an honor to uh, finish out Judge White's work term the last eight months. It's been extremely humbling. Um, having our citizens come before me and having the opportunity to help them in their time of need. 95% you know, or more people that come before the court are not in a good place in their life. And I've looked forward to this past eight months and I look forward to moving, you know, moving forward and helping them restructure and helping them get into the programs and help their families um, continue to live um, good lives. Any questions? Any questions for Luke? Luke, I just have one. Uh, you know, I know you had a private practice, and then you came on with us. Any any changes in your private practice, and that that are notable? Um, I moved buildings. Um, <laughs> it hasn't happened yet. Uh, my firm is in the process of restructuring, where I will probably be moved into a partnership position other and as of right now I'm more of an, an associate um, other than that nothing has changed okay. privately okay all right well thank you all right all in favor for Mr. Bartow those opposed yeah, yeah it's thank, thank you thank you speaker this is yours you put let's see yeah. This is a resolution recognizing citizen Terrell Bernoski. Uh, what we're doing with Terrell Bernoski, if, if uh, some of you have ever been to a Sequoia game, he is our spirit leader. And he has, he has a slight, uh, <coughs> I hate to use the word handicap, but he's, uh, he's one of our, our really devoted uh, supporters at, at our ball games. He, 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 when he's there, he, he starts a, a chant that is very similar to like when they do a stomp dance. And the whole crowd just falls into place when he's at a ball game. And we thought we'd just recognize him because he comes to all the games and, and, and he's our spirit leader. We we're going to recognize him and then at the same time we were going to comp him free admission. When we played at the, in, at the fairgrounds a year ago, the other teams that had Native American students on their team wanted to borrow him. Because, uh, he, he is, if you've ever been to Sequoia game, you'll know where he is. Somewhere in the stands, you'll look up and there's this guy leading this chant. And I just thought, uh, he, this guy's never uh, seeked or searched for notoriety, but this is, this, is a, this is probably the most notoriety he's ever had. And it's good for his self-concept. And I'll just leave it at that. I wish, I'd like for your support to recognize this guy. And I'll, I'll try to get him here sometime. But if you've ever been to Sequoia game, you'll know who I'm talking about. Put that form of emotion. Second, that's All right, we got a, any discussion, further discussion? All right, let's vote. All, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? All right, the ayes have it. Thank you, and I'll let him know. I'll, I'll see him probably this afternoon sometime. Uh, moving down, uh, Councillor Vasquez. Yes, um, a legislative act amending Title 12 of the Cherokee Nation Code annotated civil, civil procedure, comprehensive access to justice act amendment, and I believe four and five would be the same thing, essentially. Um, Chrissy Limo is here to answer any questions if we have them. And uh, I might note that these are technical amendments. Um, that's the purpose of these. So are you doing that, both four yes. and five? Or are you just doing four? Should we do just separate? Let's just do one at a time. Okay. We'll just do four. All right. okay. uh, let's put that for a motion. Do we have a second? All right, we have a second uh, discussion. We're open. Councilor Walking Stick. Uh, I was reading through this uh, throughout the week. It's got a lot of questions. Um, I guess the first one is uh, under number seven. 
Uh, section seven. Section seven. Okay. Uh, B. It says the the attorney general has uh, the ability to bring a civil cause of action in Cherokee Nation court uh, against a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. Uh, why would the AG be in the business of suing a Cherokee Nation citizen? This, that doesn't say a, a suit against a citizen. This is bringing suit on behalf of citizens. So this is it's not true class action, but it's similar to that. So there's some, you know, company doing some type of business practice within the Cherokee Nation that is harming our citizens, that the AG on behalf of the citizenship can bring a suit against that company or individual um, seeking relief that would then go instead of to individuals to the nation, whether that be to, you know, try to remedy that situation. But that's not... That's not allowing, I mean, I guess it could be a citizen if they were violating this law, but that's not what that says, that the, no. that the AG may bring a, a civil cause of action in tribal court um, or in any state where any of our citizens reside, and that would be on, on behalf of our citizens. Okay. The other is, is uh, the right to bring a suit. Uh, the whole Section 7 pretty much is <clears throat> given the AG permission to go into a lawsuit just free handedly and under the AG Act uh, he has to come through this body right here to go into a lawsuit. No, um, under the AG Act only um, litigation involving sovereignty, sovereignty or knowledge. substantial assets require ratification um, Is there by right, the council. Can we add that language into this section 7, this AG Act? Because we need to be very clear that we're not giving AG free reign to go into lawsuits that involve program dollars. And, and quite frankly, if you go and sue a tuna fish company or go get into an op op opioid, those are essentially program dollars that's coming to the tribe that we're going to be appropriating that are going to become program dollars. Well, they would be well. They would be half half general fund dollars and half sovereign wealth act fund dollars. Um, but the AG's I mean, act is if, in if there's coordination suit, with this. There's a suit and there's money coming into the tribe. Those are going to become program dollars. Therefore, that AG act states that this body right here is going to be the one to allow the AG to go sue for those program dollars to bring them back into the tribe. No, the, the ratification is only if there are sovereignty issues at stake and suing someone for money is not a sovereignty issue or essential but, assets but, but are involved. And that means assets that we have, future dollars that may come into us. This body has never ratified lawsuits where the AG's office sues an individual or company for money in, in any case. Well, this, um, this the only one that we've ever done that on was the, the trust accounting, and that was because it was it was the trust assets of the Cherokee Nation held by the United States government. But the AG Act does not require ratification. This whole section that's written in red is amended language that is very clear that gives the AG free reign to go into uh, civil action with uh, citizens or with business entities. I mean, and my, my, my thinking is, is, you know, there's always a hidden agenda b behind every legislation. And the way I read this is, you know, let's just give AG free reign to go into lawsuits. Well, <laughs> respectfully, I think he has that under the AG Act. Again, don't, we don't. I disagree. If we are going after someone for money, we don't have to get pre approval <clears throat> from the council of that. Only if we're, if it, affect some asset that we already have some some money we already have some some land in as in our trust case timber those types of things but we've already i mean we do this we do this all the time we were we sue to recover default loans through commerce we last foreclose. six years last six years i've been on the council it's happened all the time and, and it's my fault I, I i didn't read the ag act but when i did read it i started realizing that the AG is supposed to be coming through this body and the chief because 
were the clients. And the well, clients. The Cherokee people are the client. Well, no, well, yeah. But the chief, the deputy, the chief and this body were the clients, were the ones that determined if we want to go sue a tuna fish company. Because the harm that, that the re repercussion of that is, is we might, we might see that there, there may be harm to the tribe that you guys may not see. And we may not want to sue a tuna fish company. But you guys continue to go out and you, you act, you know, on your own wheel. Uh, but we need to we need to we need to really uh, follow the AG Act. I mean that's it was there for a purpose. So one or two people weren't making decisions, but there's a joint decision being made when we go into class action suits. That involves program. Sick. There's dollars. nothing. First of all, we have the Constitution that gives the AG the ability to represent the nation in civil suits. But it, it, yeah, exactly. Represent. There's but, nothing in the AG Act that requires all lawsuits filed on behalf of the nation be ratified by council really and it would be impossible to do so i mean we we are in cases when we look at icw cases criminal cases again foreclosure actions commerce loans all of the things that we do the day-to-day -day business that we do on behalf of the nation it would be lists a hundred pages long of of pending litigation that we're involved in I mean, they're big suits that we all know about because they're big suits and they get attention. But, but the council does not control whether or not the AG files a lawsuit in, it, in the basic sense. So if you guys get yourself in a pickle, uh, it's not going to come back on the AG's office. It's going to come back on the chief's office in this body right here, ultimately. Well, yeah, and if it, if it and, and deals the with the assets or the sovereignty of the nation, you do have a say in it. Exactly, and that's what I was referring to. In assets of this this nation lawsuits that result in millions of dollars for assets not not until we win not until we get them well that's um, <coughs> then the other part under chapter 2 section 11 it says that the, the limitations of actions it says within one year in action for libel slander malicious prosecution or false imprisonment an action upon statute for penalty or for forfeiture, except <clears throat> where the statute imposing it's, it prescribes a different limitation. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this part right here, if there's something that took place four years ago, what this is saying is you, you, you're not able to go back four years ago and accuse someone of slander, malicious prosecution, and et cetera. Is that correct? Correct. And and these okay, and so, are in line with, with regular statutes of limitation. We just haven't had them in our code before. There's, I mean, there's no particular reason for that other than to, again, to try to kind of be in line with other state and federal statutes of limitation. Yeah. And if there's a separate statute for libel or slander that provides for a longer statute of limitation, that would can control over this. But, yes, that says in those cases you can only go back a year. The next session says for contracts and um, forfeiture you can only go back three years for um, contracts in writing five years for trespass and other torts five years I guess we could have this read five years all the way across the board though if we wanted to right if we wanted to amend it that way for five six years you, I mean ab absolutely there there are reasons for having different statutes of limitations and I mean we can talk about those I can provide you some information but those are generally in line with um, state statutes as well and there's another part here I didn't like it was the um, portion about whether the AG could come and if he had if he had reason to say that a council member in here was slandering the AG he could come in and do perform an investigation, freehand lead, confiscate cell phones, computers, freeze emails, go in there to uh, is that is, is this act is it does it read that that A G has the ability to come in and, and, and apprehend computers or whatever, saying, Well you know, we slander the AG, and he wants to bring proof. 
to, to do that? So, <clears throat> no. Um, as far as the the slander issue, that's that's just the statute of limitations. So this it says investigation by the attorney general. It's uh, page 26. You're talking about page. <coughs> Councilor Walker, stick. Would you be in favor of tabling this? Because I have questions and we have other questions, and there's two or three Looks parts. Like and several. I move to table it. Okay. Second. Second. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I get. I got a lot more questions. Uh, we have a motion to table. I can't find. We got a second. Uh, all in favor. Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. I, I, I oppose because I've got a lot of questions about what this targets and why we are targeting. And this investigation stuff is just, there have been members of this council who have been investigating while I've been here my six years of term. <clears throat> my son was illegally wiretapped years ago back in the 90s. Don't tell me that stuff doesn't happen in this tribe. That's my statement. Thank you, sir. Question. Can I withdraw my table? I, I, uh, can I withdraw my motion and say, can we table this to the next meeting? Yeah, we, I mean, it's tabled. It'll be on the next meeting. It will be held. We can yeah. discuss yeah. this at the next yeah. meeting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I want to make sure of that. Yep. Thank you. We would be happy if, prior to that if anyone has wants to send us written questions as well. I mean, we can still ask them in the meeting, but if. Yeah. You can email us. Can Henry be here today? Um, he's Where is Todd? Todd's on medical leave. Oh. Ken? Yes. Huh. Okay. Uh, moving down. Uh, Councilor Vasquez, you've got the next one. This is a legislative act amending Title 12 of the Cherokee Nation Code. And a civil procedure. Is that in front of the motion? We have a motion. Do we have a second? Do we have a second? Motion fails. No second. Motion fails. Uh, moving down. Uh, Councilor Walking Stick. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, this is an act relating to the amendment to the Concurrent Enrollment Scholarship Act of 2011 to revise eligibility requirements. Um, I'd like to put that into a form of a motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, okay. Discussion? Uh, there's some friendly amendments yes, I'd like to add to this. Yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> under Section 2, under the purpose, uh, strike or private uh, and then moving down to section four under definitions strike or private uh, moving down to section five uh, students must be a, a citizen of the Cherokee Nation so you would amend in red just put add after a citizen of the Cherokee Nation and I would strike um, citizen. Okay. Um, under section five, one B, uh, strike <coughs> if the student attends a public high school. And then under uh, E, where it says. Um, six credit hours of tuition books and required fees per spring and or fall add per spring and or fall after fees semesters yeah after yeah fall semester <clears throat> correct and then the same thing for section f where it says six credit hours of books and requirement fees per spring and or fall semester and those are all my family uh, friendlies. Uh, Sean, do you, do you accept those? Yes, sir. Okay. Council, I think you have to have this today. Yes, sir. It needs to be. Um, they need to start printing their their stuff 
uh, in education in February. So it needs Jennifer to be. Here. Uh, Ron and Jennifer here. Yeah. It needs, yeah. to, be, guys come it needs to be approved today, Speaker. <coughs> Have a, the amended recommendation? Uh, yes. That one Tell me what the stickers read on. Said, okay, yes. so you're good with education. With uh, it's fully supported. Okay. All right. That's yeah. what we wanted to hear. All right. Any further discussion? Any questions? Yeah, by acclamation. Right. By acclamation. All in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? The ayes have it. All right. Uh, moving down. Looks like. Any announcements? Uh, I know uh, Dr. Dobbins, <coughs> you have an announcement, sir? Yes, I do. A brief one. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. <coughs> yeah, I'm, just, I'm uh, very, very disappointed to be today, but uh, the reason I'm not there is because on my council calendar, this, these three meetings were scheduled for Thursday, January 25th, last Thursday of the month. But then were changed on December 28th to today, Wednesday, January 17th. Uh, we do have rules of procedure governing the, the tribal council that address changing meeting times, and we this change here was did not follow procedure at all. So I just next month I just like to have a discussion just to make the full council aware that uh, there are certain procedures that we have to go through if we're going to change meeting times. So. Uh, Thank you for letting me share that with you. Yes, yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, any other announcements? I'll take full responsibility for that. We usually just have Shelley or Gail poll the, the council members and, and make the change. And, and this time, uh, I think what happened was the the culture of finance wanted just to come down a day early and spend the night and get it over with. The next day, when Chief asked me to change the <coughs> the meeting from Monday on the 15th to the 16th, and that just kind of created a little bit of chaos there. But we do have rules, and we'll make sure that everybody's consulted. We're going to make any changes in our meeting. So I'll, I'll take full responsibility for that. Councilor Vasquez. Before the, the adjourn, I wanted to ask if, Shelley, if it's not too late to be added as a sponsor to the Luke Barto nomination. Sorry for <coughs> Anybody else? Uh, next meeting is tentatively scheduled for Thursday, February 22nd at 1. I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. Second. All right. We are adjourned. <laughs>